So glad to see the place packed uh, the way it should be. Uh, this is the most important <coughs> session of the day. <laughs> These four people. Um, I actually missed a couple this morning, and I feel badly about that. Uh, but uh, I had time to go through the posters uh, and notice that there were 14 posters in the poster session. And uh, I think virtually every one of them was dealing with the sciences. Uh, mostly chemistry, and it got my attention that two of them were dealing with caffeine. If you haven't, if you haven't seen it, you should go over. So, uh, uh, you know, since I teach 8 o'clock classes, I know that my students like caffeine. Uh, in any case, um, I've been doing this off and on now for the 16 years that we've had uh, uh, the Academic Excellence Conference, and I've seen these sessions get better and better and better. I think you're in for a treat today. Uh, the students uh, know me as their teacher and mentor, uh, but uh, I want them to, to go away from this realizing how valuable and how precious they are to me. Uh, one of the things that keeps those of us who are professors in the classroom uh, is the joy that we take from mentoring students uh, and seeing how they progress over the years. Um, the four students here I've known, uh, I've certainly known one since she was a freshman, uh, and I've known the others certainly since they were sophomores, and I've seen this just, just tremendous change in them, which is one of the delights of being a professor of undergraduate students. Uh, they come fresh out of high school, and they really do lead young adults. Um, these four people I have probably a closer relationship uh, than anybody else I've taught, uh, largely because not only are they my students, but uh, we happen to be in Krakow, Poland at the same time. Um, uh, I wasn't their teacher over there, but they came to my office hours more than my European students. <laughs> so, um, so, so we got to know each other in a way that uh, was, was very different. Um, so in any case, um, Dylan Renner, <coughs> Kat Marin, Liam Marin, and Tanner Semelrock. It took me a while to get his name down. <laughs> Tanner Semelrock. And uh, they're going to give you different perspectives on what it was like to be in Poland. And it's all in your hands. <laughs> all in your great good hands. <laughs> Alrighty, well welcome everyone to our Academic Excellence presentation on Poland and the Study Abroad Experience. So as Dr. Vincent mentioned, the four of us study abroad in Krakow, Poland, so we are here to kind of give you guys a taste of what that was like. We are very grateful and very lucky for our experience in Poland, and we had an amazing time, and we want to share that with you. So as mentioned, my name is Catherine Marin. I'm a double major in Holocaust and Genocide <coughs> Studies and U.S. History, and I'm minoring in International Relations. And I'll be talking about kind of snapshots of what life was like in Krakow, Poland. Hey guys, my name is Dylan Renner. Um, <coughs> I'm a senior, graduating in May as well in Holocaust and Genocide Studies um, with a minor in music and international studies. Um, and I will be presenting um, on our travels outside of Krakow and Poland. Hi everyone, my name is Tanner Semelrock. I am a senior double majoring in political science and Holocaust and Genocide Studies with a minor in philosophy. And today I'll be discussing the academic life in Krakow. And I'm Liam McGann, and I am an HGS major, and I'll be talking about our first encounter with Auschwitz. So I'm here to give you guys a brief snapshot of what life is like in Krakow. <coughs> we lived there for over five months, so it's impossible for kind of tell you guys about what five months was like, but I'm going to try my best with a few key moments, stories, and places. All right, so the first key place for us was the main market square of Krakow. In Polish, it's Renet Gowni. So this originally dates back to the 13th century and is the largest medieval town square in all of Europe. And in 1978, it was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
So the two main features of it are these two pictures here. This is St. Mary's Basilica. It was built in the 14th century, and it's home to a really famous wooden altarpiece carved by Viet Strauss. <coughs> and in Krakow tradition, every hour on the hour, a trumpet player climbs to the highest tower here and plays the Krakowian anthem that can be heard all throughout the city. The second main piece is Cloth Hall. So this was a major center for merchants and commerce throughout the medieval ages and into the 15th century for Krakow. Modern day, it is home to the famous Sukhanitsa Museum, home to Polish art and Polish sculpture. So modern day Main Market Square is a lively center full of street performers, open air restaurants, and it's a meeting place for a lot of students and multiple people in Krakow. And what's fun about the Main Market Square is that during festivals and seasons like Easter and Christmas, the entire square is full of markets and booths full of food, arts, and also Polish performers to celebrate the seasons. All right, another key <coughs> place in Krakow was the Wawel Castle. So Krakow is known as the city of the dragon. So legend has it that during the reign of King Kazimir, a dragon was terrorizing the city of Krakow, and no one could slay the dragon. So the king put up a proposition that if anyone could slay the dragon, that they would get to marry his daughter, the princess. So a lowly shoemaker came to Wawel and tricked the dragon into eating a smoldering meal and caused the dragon to drink half of the river there. The dragon was slayed and the shoemaker got to marry the princess. So for some, different, some more factual history. The <laughs> 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 Pablo Castle was built by King Casimir during the 13th century and is the most important historical site in all of Poland and it is a symbol of Polish statehood. It has played a varying different role throughout <coughs> history. So during the time of the Nazi occupation, this was home to Hans Frank, who was the gen general governor of the general government of Poland. So he was in charge of all Polish affairs during the Nazi occupation. So he chose Wawel Castle to be where he would live and set up state there. So this is a key center during the war. Um, so the Wawel Castle is also home to the Wawel Cathedral. So this is the Royal Cathedral. It's over 900 years old, and it was built in the 14th century. It was the cathedral to Pope John Paul II while he was still only Bishop Karl Wojciechow, and it was also home to all of the coronations of Polish royalty. And modern day for the castle is the Dragon Festival to commemorate the city of the dragon, the legend, and the history. So as you can see, there are balloon rides that reenact the fateful shoemaker dragon standoff. There is parades, fireworks, and there's different festivals to commemorate the history. And when there isn't the Dragon Festival, the riverbank is full of people from Krakow who can roam around and you can explore the castle grounds. <coughs> Where we studied was the Agalonian University. So this university was founded in 1364 by King Kazimir. He did a lot. Um, <laughs> is the oldest university in Poland and the second oldest in Central Europe and one of the oldest ones in all of Europe. So there's been over 650 years of education occurring at Jagiellonian. Jagiellonian, like the castle, played multiple roles throughout history. So during the Nazi occupation of Poland, on November 6, 1939, 184 professors were arrested here because after the Nazis occupied Poland, they went through to wipe out the intelligentsia of Poland to minimize resistance to the Nazi regime. So Jagiellonian was one of the first places targeted. Those professors were sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Um, some notable alumni <coughs> of Jagiellonian are, Ni are Nicholas Copernicus, the Copernicus, and Pope John Paul II. So they're kind of fun. So modern day Jagiellonian has, the city has over 40,000 students in it, and Krakow itself is a huge student city with over 200,000 students living in it, which is really fun. Um, so they have a festival called Juvenalia to celebrate the student life and it being such a student city. So as you can tell from the pictures here, um, they have a color festival, there's concerts, there's big parades just to celebrate over 600 years of learning in the city of Krakow. All right. <coughs> Museums of Krakow. So one of the great things about the city of Krakow is that there were tons of museums in it. A lot of them were free to students. So what we would sometimes do is on a day off, we would make a list of all the free ones and pick whatever museum we wanted to see that day. So there were tons of options. There were archaeological museums focusing on the medieval archaeological history, 
archaeological history of Europe and of the world. One of our favorites was there's an, a medieval archaeological museum underneath Cloth Hall that shows the medieval ruins of the city. There were also a lot of different art museums that had Polish <coughs> art, Krakowian art, and European art. There were also lots of history ones, so history of Poland in general, Poland during the Holocaust, and Krakow local history. Another one of our favorite museums was the University of Jagiellonian Museum, so the museum for our school. Um, you can see what the university looked like in the 13th century, and they also had artifacts from the alumni. So you can see the first ever globe that was made, and a lot of Copernicus's astronomy tools, which is really fun to see. So the district of Kazimierz was is a distinct town on the outskirts of Krakow, which was a traditionally Jewish neighborhood. So in the district of Kazimierz, there are a few different synagogues there that have historically been a part of Krakow's Jewish history, and they're still standing today, and you can learn about the Jewish history not only of Poland, but of Krakow as well. It also is a major cultural center that a lot of students go to, and it's a fun place to see. Um, there's also different museums devoted to Jewish history of Poland and Jewish history of the Holocaust. One of those museums is the Galicia Museum which is known for, it's a photography museum of the Jewish experience in Poland during the Holocaust, both before and after. We currently, this is fun, we have a student from Keene State College who's studying abroad in Poland who's interning at that museum right now. So that's quite fun. Okay. <laughs> 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 So Polish food was really good, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> um, so the first dish we have here is pierogi. This is a traditional Eastern European dumpling, and it's very popular in Poland. Our favorite restaurant was pierogi Mr. Vincent. <laughs> it had over 30 kinds of pierogi, and we did try to try them all. <laughs> um, this over here is kielbasa. This is Polish sausage, and it's a staple in cuisine. Um, this over here, the, the, the third thing I'm holding, um, <laughs> is called zapikanka. This is a traditional Polish street food, and it's an open-faced sandwich that was invented in the 1970s with mushrooms and cheese on it. You put all the toppings on it. And this is traditionally in Kazimierz, so that's fun. So this district is Nowa Huta. So <coughs> this was a communist neighborhood that was built in 1949 to be in be a model communist neighborhood on the outskirts of Krakow. It was meant to be a major industrial center and was home to one of the largest steel mills in all of Poland. It was also home to the Solidarity Movement, or Solidarność, which was the movement in Poland to overthrow communism and move towards democracy. <coughs> so Lach Walesa, who was a major um, Solidarność activist, led a lot of revolts here and strikes. And that's all done. <coughs> Alright, so, um, we've seen Krakow, um, I'm going to take you guys outside of Krakow this time, um, up into central Poland, the capital of Warsaw, and then I'm going to focus on a few, um, three other places, Vienna, Serbia, and Budapest that we travel to um, in uh, our time abroad. <coughs> so, when studying abroad, um, we went to many countries. Um, a few of these countries were uh, study trips hosted by CES, which was the program we were with at Jagiellonian. Um, so one of the trips was Warsaw, and this is the capital of Poland. It's about a four-hour train ride north from Krakow. <coughs> the city is different from Krakow in that Krakow doesn't allow the skyscraper to be built, and it's the cultural capital of Poland. Um, compared to Warsaw, which is the capital, um, the official capital, so it's much more industrialized, economically advanced. You can see skyscrapers. You know, it's illegal to build skyscrapers in Krakow. The tallest building is the cathedral. Um, so in Warsaw, they're in the process of building these um, magnificent skyscrapers, as you can see. Um, the, split, the city is kind of split between the first, this, like the main middle section of the city, with um, very economically. Um, um, bustling area, and then the part on the other side is the Old Town. Um, it's interesting because the Old Town was completely leveled after the war. There, none of that was there. This was all rebuilt after the war um, by uh, by the Soviets. And you can see on the left this magnificent thing. 
um, was a gift to the people of Poland from Stalin. It is called the Center for Science and Culture. Palace of Science. Palace of Science and Culture. <laughs> but it is known by the Poles and not by us as Stalin's penis. <laughs> so that's a fun fact. Because um, they don't like Stalin. <laughs> um, so, as I said, um, it, was, it was just cool to kind of get a really cool vision of what Warsaw is becoming and what it was. Um, so, one in Warsaw, um, there are still uh, relics from before the war. This is uh, the only remaining synagogue from the original Jewish quarter in Warsaw. It is um, called the Nozak Synagogue. Um, and it's the only one remaining from that time. Um, next to it is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Memorial. And on one side is uh, a commemoration to those who um, died in the ghetto and who lived there. And the other side is a commemoration to those who actually fought against the Nazi regime um, in, uh, during the uprising. And it was, um, as HGS majors, this was um, very impactful for us to come across these monuments and these memorials. <clears throat> um, so we were, in, we were in Warsaw for the weekend. Our second day um, <coughs> was pretty much left up to us. It's what we wanted to do. So we decided to go off and walk around and explore the city. And we came across, um, kind of walked into this area of the city that had the ghetto in it. And we were like, let's try to find like, the wall and see where it used to be. So you can see this box right here is like the majority of Warsaw. And that's the ghetto. So you can see how big it was. You had four, over 400,000 um, Jews put in this um, very tiny area, but that very tiny area was very large in this, in this city. Um, it's just a lot of people cramped into one spot. And throughout our other tra um, our walk that day, we would come across these little monuments in the, in the ground that kind of showed where the wall was. Um, and then we'd also come across things like this is the remnants of a prison, um, not necessarily anything to do specifically with the Nazis in World War II, but it was a prison um, that housed people from Poland and like political elites before they actually started persecuting Jews um, during the Holocaust. Um, and yeah, it's like another just example of running across these relics that just always kind of brought us back to like why we study what we study. <clears throat> so Serbia um, was not a country I don't think any of us ever thought <coughs> we would travel to. Um, this was probably one of the most underrated countries. It's probably one of the most underappreciated countries. I've ever been to. The landscape is absolutely gorgeous. The people are the most welcome and the nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. Um, like they will literally give you the clothes off your back um, if you need them. Of course, we didn't. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's one thing. We'll just like, hey, take this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, this was a Serbian memorial uh, to the. So this Serbi, back in the 1400s, a Serbian general, um, well, it was like 500, 500 men of his. They were fighting the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had this huge army. It was like 20,000 people. And um, they were invading this little field, this little countryside right here. And the Serb general decided to blow up the fortress on top of this hill and kill himself and all his men, and in the process, defeated the Ottoman Empire. So this is a memorial um, to represent that victory and um, all the, you know, <coughs> commemorations of um, people who died there. Um, and that was just very cool to see, um, like a true Serbian memorial. Um, this was <coughs> in the northern part of Serbia, which is very close to the southern part of Hungary. Um, this architecture from the synagogue is very Hungarian, um, just because of the influence close to the border. Um, this was the synagogue, was called the uh, Jakob and Komar Square Synagogue in Sobotica, Serbia. And it was closed. Um, they have this little uh, commemoration on the side that um, they, pre they pretty much just used the synagogue as um, a memorial to uh, people who died during World War II, the Yugoslav War after that as well. <clears throat> um, these are other monuments that we came across in Serbia. Um, in HGS, in the HGS program here, Keen, we study the Holocaust, Rwanda genocide, we also study the Bosnian genocide. Um, this is 
one monument that um, definitely made, made us think about um, not just the Jewish Holocaust, um, but the other genocides we study, such as Bosnia. The Serbs were the perpetrators in the Bosnian genocide against Bosnians, obviously. Um, so this is a memorial. Um, the bottom left um, is a memorial to those who died in the Yugoslav War, um, including um, <coughs> including including Serbs as well, um, but just made us you know kind of think back to our studies of the Bosnian genocide. And then on the left are the um, the Banaba uh, monument, um, which uh, remembers fallen Yugoslav World War II fighters, um, and uh, it's just a very strong, proud kind of like it's supposed to represent three fists, um, and it's a very communist communistic and. Uh, yeah, um, very much, um, very much Soviet Soviet style architecture. Um, and so the last part of uh, Serbia was um, an even more recent um, kind of like uh, it was a more recent um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? example of things we study here at school. So we studied, like I said, the Bosnian genocide, um, the way the Yugoslav War ended was pretty much NATO bombing the crap out of. Serbs, and this is the result right here. So, um, <clears throat> this is the Serbian army headquarters. Um, we passed it while driving to Belgrade, and the Serbs are interesting. They don't, um, sometimes they don't memorialize things with a plaque or anything. They literally just leave this here for people to see as they drive by, and that's, that's the memorial. It's just, it is how it is, and it stands to remember things. This is the outside of a concentration camp, the uh, Chevny Christ concentration camp which was used um, during, the, during the Yugoslav War as well. Um, uh, we weren't allowed inside, it's closed, um, permanently closed, but they kind of just leave it there to stand and do a memorial as well. <clears throat> so the last few trips we'll talk about really quick are Vienna um, and Budapest. We went on these um, independently, so we planned all these by ourselves, set up hostels, trains, buses, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> we did a lot of different things with the planes, buses, and then just, yeah, all sorts of transportation. Um, Vienna was a beautiful city. It looked like it was built yesterday, honestly. Um, it's pristine, it's clean, um, and uh, Austrians are some of the nicest people you ever meet also. This is us after 30 hours-ish of traveling without any sleep. Um, and not being able to check into our hostel for 12 hours, so we kind of took a nap on this memorial until we were able to check in. <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. Um, down below, you can kind of see what I was talking about, like Vienna, like it, that's the opera house, the main opera house, and it's just like it's absolutely just a beautiful city. At night during the daytime, you can see on the uh, right that's the Sh I'm butchering the name, the Schomburg, Schomburg Schom Palace. Um, in Vienna, it's cool because you have this <coughs> city, but then at points it will just open up into like behind the palace with these gardens, or right next, um, right next to like the uh, Austrian Library, which we went to. There's this big park, and you can walk through. So it's very nice. You get um, open space, and then the city feel at the same time. We would also stumble upon these monuments. Like we had no idea this was here. We kind of just were walking through the middle of the city, and came across this uh, uh, monument against war and fascism, um, with this quote. Um, uh, from Adolf Hitler up here, it's just supposed to, and then everything that the monuments made out of right here are parts and like pieces of constant of a concentration camp from uh, nearby in Austria. So um, it was very impactful for us to see that and to kind of um, <coughs> it was reassuring to know that people put these things up um, in, in uh, memoration of that. This is uh, <coughs> what we're talking about. This is Budapest, aka the motherland. Um, probably one of our favorite cities. We spent about five days here over Easter break, um, and it was just an incredible city. We got to know it really well. Um, it's, it's, it's Budapest, not Budapest. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's real. So you have Buda over here, and then you have Pest down here. Um, we spent most of our time in Pest. is a uh, very culture, er, culturally uh, diverse area, lots of um, touristy sites. Buda up on the hill is more where people live, and um, they have the castle that you can visit. Um, <clears throat> but it was just a very grand, large, like, just, like, heroic city, while at the same time, it um, had a lot of the same kind of architecture as Vienna, but it was way more grungy and, like, dirty and down-to-earth and just, like, awesome, like, in general. Um, 
And we did, um, as well, stumble upon a lot of monuments while we were here as well. Um, <clears throat> first one, um, this is a very famous one. It's called uh, The Shoes on the Danube Bay <coughs> Memorial. And it's a remembrance of um, Hungarian Jews who were literally shot off this ledge into the river during, um, during the Holocaust. Um, it's uh, specifically towards Jews, um, the rounding up of 800,000 Hungarian Jews, which was probably one of the most <coughs> parts of the entire Holocaust, and it was, um, we, we stopped and we sat right behind these shoes for a good 15, 20 minutes in silence, just kind of pondering and reminiscing and just like sitting there and kind of almost benediction to people, you know, who had lost their lives, and um, it's just something we study every day, so it was very, very close to us. Um, next to it is uh, something we actually didn't look for, we actually stumbled upon it. Raoul Wallenberg was a diplomat in Hungary during the um, Holocaust, and he um, is considered a, like a savior because he um, illegally made passports for Jews um, to escape to different countries outside of the occupied territory. Um, and we literally were looking for a donut shop, and just happened to come across this picture of the Best Wall Monument, and we're like, wow, that's just the coolest thing. Like, we read up, we always read about him and stuff. Professor Vincent loves him, and then he, just, he was there all the time. And um, this last picture is of the uh, Grand Synagogue, um, another, um, another very prominent Jewish uh, um, thing in Europe. It's the largest, <coughs> largest synagogue in Europe, um, one of the largest in the world. Um, and we weren't able to go in. It, you need like a reservation and all, all this other stuff. So we kind of just um, went outside and, and looked for it and walked around it. And the thing is massive. It's like twice, three times the size of the Science Center. Um, but it's something we definitely hope to go into next time. And um, yeah, Budapest was very, very influenced um, with everything that we study here at school. So it was a very special trip for us. Um, <coughs> Tanner is going to talk about academic life. Do a little switch up yeah. real quick. I have a Do real cash. All right. <coughs> So yes, I will be talking about the academic, academic life in Krakow, uh, focusing on the courses that we took and the outcomes of those courses. So to start off, I wanted to give you some statistics about the Agamonian University. Um, so the Agamonian University has currently uh, over 41,000 students, so it's a very large uh, university, uh, one of the biggest in Poland. Uh, and uh, they also have over 3,000 PhD students, just to you know, put that in perspective. So while we were uh, studying Krakow, we actually studied at the Center for European Studies, which is a subset of the Ekmanian University. Uh, the Center for European Studies has sort of two purposes. One of them is a master's program, and the other is a undergraduate uh, program, mainly for study abroad students. So at the master's level, you could study uh, things such as European studies, European politics, uh, Eastern and European uh, states, and regional studies, as well as Russian studies, so quite diverse. Um, amount of programs within that at the master's level, but uh, we uh, became accustomed to CES through the study abroad program. Uh, both of these programs have international students from all around the world, uh, from as far away as Japan to as close by as Ukraine and Poland itself. Um, what was kind of important for us about CES, um, Center for European Studies, <coughs> is that uh, most of our courses were offered at the center specifically. So in the picture, uh, first picture on the top left, uh, the building behind the sign is uh, the actual building and where we took most of our courses. Um, and it was also a pretty important meeting place for us. We were able to uh, gain a lot of friends through interacting with students. They had a couple of student lounges uh, at the center. And so it was really important for us to make those connections, not only with the students, but also with the staff that was there. <coughs> Keep trying to tell them they spelled center wrong, but I guess it's <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, the first course I'm going to be talking about, and was probably one of the most important courses that we had, was unfortunately the Polish language course. <laughs> You'll understand that in a moment. Um, so, uh, part of our education in Poland was taking a beginner's Polish language course um, that was taught by a Polish woman who was fluent in English as well. Um, it, Polish uh, is actually one of the hardest languages to learn in the world, um, so hence why we struggled with it. But, uh, you know, it was extremely important for us for um, multiple levels. Um, 
you know, we were able to learn about <coughs> some of the basics when we first start studying language. So uh, things such as, you know, how to say your name, how to order food, uh, different vocabulary and such. Uh, so it was really important for us. But uh, what was more important was that we were able to take this language and then use it on an everyday basis within the city itself. And that allowed us to retain the language a lot more, but then also interact a lot more with the uh, individuals uh, in Krakow and uh, engage more in their culture and looking at different signs and such. Um, we were able to get a better feel and uh, appreciate it really for the city. Um, so yeah, it was uh, a pretty good course, even though Professor might have said I was dyslexic over there. But yeah. <laughs> 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 I had some pronunciation and that stuff. It didn't really go too well. Uh, so the second course I wanted to talk about is the Transatlantic <coughs> course uh, since, uh, from 1945 to the early 2000s. Uh, so this course was taught by a British professor uh, who has been in Poland for the past 20 years, uh, fell in love with the country in Krakow specifically, so he ended up uh, staying. So um, what we learned in this course was mainly discussing and analyzing the end of World War II and Europe and U.S. relations since the end of uh, World War II and also throughout the Cold War and then moving into the Yugoslav War and then um, in more uh, modern topics such as 9-11. Uh, um, this was really important for us because we were able to learn about um, learn about U.S. history through a European perspective, which was uh, really transformative for some of us uh, and gave us a better perspective of um, you know, some of the things that we've been learning as far as uh, World War II and uh, So, um, yeah, and one of the other important things about this course specifically was that we were able to study um, specific <coughs> cities and uh, also be able to travel to those cities. So, on the screen here, we have a picture of the Berlin Wall, and then that's I'm going to share with you, that's the Eiffel Tower. So, um, being able to study that history and then also visit those places was uh, an important aspect of our study abroad experience. Uh, the third course I want to highlight is the course we took called uh, Jews in Central Europe. Uh, this course was taught by a, uh, again, another Polish woman who was fluent in English. All of our courses were taught in English. God, we're very Polish. <laughs> 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 um, so in this course, uh, we mainly focused on Jewish life, post, uh, both pre- and post-Holocaust in Central and Eastern Europe, with a specific focus on Krakow. Uh, so this course gave us the ability to study a narrative and a place in which it took place, which was really powerful for us, um, as well as engage in the city through multiple field trips. Uh, so while we took this class with Dr. Gadlin, uh, she brought us on four different field trips throughout the city and on outside of Krakow as well. Uh, the first field trip we went on was to Kashmir, as Kat had already uh, discussed. Uh, while we were there, uh, that was at the beginning of the course, so we were. Uh, trying to understand um, pre-Holocaust Jewish life within the city. So we went around and looked at some historical sites, uh, some synagogues, and also a um, graveyard, which uh, one of the walls, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, is actually made of Jewish tombstones that were destroyed during the Holocaust. Um, that wall is actually replicated at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it's one of the last things you would see if you visit the museum. The second field trip that we took was actually walking around the Krakow ghetto. So um, our professor had a little handout and it had all the streets in which would make up the Krakow ghetto and we walked the perimeter and she highlighted <coughs> some buildings that are still there which uh, played an important role within the daily life inside the ghetto. Um, this was kind of transformative because we were able to see how history transforms into its modern setting. So understanding what that history was during the Holocaust, but then kind of seeing how it transforms into uh, today, which is pretty, pretty powerful. Um, <coughs> and uh, the third trip that we went on was uh, to uh, Schindler's Factory Museum. She was actually um, the board of directors for the museum when it was created. Uh, so she played an important role as far as um, kind of helping influence the shape of the museum and the concept of it. Um, that was really interesting because we were able to give a um, first-hand guide throughout the museum, uh, and also learn a couple fun facts, one of which um, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, got a tour of the museum by our professor, and she uh, had this kind of interesting moment where she told 
<coughs> state aside, much to the displease of her security guards, and uh, kind of discuss uh, some current things going on uh, with regard to women of Lansing. So they're contrary to what you're going to hear today. Um, one of the last things I wanted to highlight um, was that through this course, we are also able to visit, uh, visit Auschwitz, which we will discuss in a little bit, as well as uh, some commemoration events, which actually tied into the last class. Um, <coughs> while we were, so the fourth class we took is a racism and nationalism course, and it was taught by a Polish American woman who lived in America, the US, um, for probably the first 30 years of her life, and then subsequently traveled to Poland to explore some of her heritage and history uh, from her family. So in this course, we uh, really learned about the definition and origin of the word racism and nationalism. Uh, but what was more impactful in this course was the trip that we were able to go on. Uh, one of which in the top left, or actually the book photos refer to this, or actually all of them, um, <laughs> uh, was the uh, March of Remembrance, uh, which commemorates the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto. Uh, so the picture on the left is everyone uh, gathered in the square, and actually if you go back a photo, um, that is a picture of a chair in the square. So, um, just going to move that up because it's too much or uh, what's currently there. But um, on this day, everyone gathered at the square itself, uh, the ghetto square, and then traveled a few miles down to the Plashov uh, labor camp, where most of these individuals were either brought there, they thought they could work, or were transported to Auschwitz. Um, so it was really transformative uh, for all of us because we were able to uh, dive into this history, <coughs> and engage first part, and kind of learn the importance of narrative after a post-genocidal society and the important role that that plays in commemoration. Um, the picture on the top right is a picture of the ghetto wall, um, ironically designed almost as tombstones, and the bottom or the, yeah, the bottom photo is a monument that the communists built uh, in commemoration of the Holocaust. Um, and one of the last things which me and Malachi picked up on, so I'll just touch briefly, was the March of the Living. Um, and through this experience, we went to and engaged in a lot of uh, things similar to uh, this with the March of Remembrance, but I'll let him talk about that. I just ate like six. <laughs> I apologize in advance. I have a very untimely cold. Um, so I'm going to be talking about our first encounter with Auschwitz um, during the march. So. <laughs> um, so the March of the Living is something that has been happening every year since 1988. Um, on Yom Neshelo, which is Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, youth, primarily youth from around the world, come and march from Auschwitz 1 to Birkenau, which is a three kilometer walk. It's a silent march in memory of those who perished at Auschwitz 1 and Birkenau and all the other camps. Auschwitz 1. Um, <coughs> and so, um, since it started in 1980, over 220,000 people have participated in this march. Uh, when we were there, there was 10,000 other people alongside us. So was a very big event. Uh, so these are some photos we took on the day of the event. That's Kat's paddle. She wanted me to say that. Um, we were given a paddle that you could write any message you want. And when we got to Birkenau, you could place it in the train tracks there. And just it was really interesting to read every, the different stuff people wrote, like for my grandmother, or like for the Jews, or just any sort of different stuff, different languages. I was right up near a group of like Mexicans. Uh, they were at the front with us. And, um, I myself was with a group of United States adults, so that was a little different um, because most of the people were like young, young teenagers. Uh, Kat and Tara were with Australian teenagers, which we got to hang out with towards the end. Um, and so we did the march, and when we got there, uh, the first thing that I was struck by was how big it was. I have read a million things about Auschwitz, and I did not fully understand how big it was. But you just walk, you walk in right under here, and it's just the barracks go on forever in this direction, and the barracks are this way, and it just goes all the way to the back. You can't even see the end. You can't even see the outside edges of it. <coughs> I thought I was prepared for like how big it was going to be, but it was bigger than what I even was prepared for. Um, and of course, as we're walking, they're reading the names of children who perished in Auschwitz. So they're saying, you know, I can't think of a Polish name, but names in like age three. And so you're like, okay, 
she's three, and then it's like seven months, and you know, ten years old, and you're just like, wow. Um, and so what I was struck by, this was the first time I cried that day, I cried a lot that day, um, was <coughs> I realized I'm like, I'm walking exactly where millions and millions and millions of people walked to their deaths, because the, uh, there's a ceremony at the end that was in the back where all the crematorium, crematoria are, and so I was literally walking the same exact path that all the people that were chosen for death immediately walked. So that was a very emotionally overwhelming experience for me. Yes. <coughs> um, what I took away from it the most was during the ceremony there was this song, and I wish that we could listen to the whole thing because it's very powerful, but um, this was the second time I cried that day. Um, <laughs> Dr. Vincent was sitting right next to me, so he can attest to that. <laughs> um, so I'll just read the lyrics. <clears throat> when I hold my grandson close to me, and his fingers trace the pattern of my tears, he asked me, Grandpa, tell me why do you cry? What is it that you fear? And I tell him, there once was another child who smelled as sweet and felt as warm. But he was taken from before my eyes, and only I remain to mourn. And that just hit me very hard, because previously we were reading the names of children, and I've read a lot of different survivor stories where they survived the Holocaust, and they started a new family, and they're the only ones that remember this one son they had who was two or three years old before the Holocaust. And so that was a very powerful moment for me. Um, another thing, my experience in Auschwitz, this is a tattoo that I have. Um, it means the core in Hebrew, it means remember. Um, and my time in Auschwitz was really one of the driving factors why I wanted to get that tattoo, just as like, this is why I study this, like to remember what happened, to remember for these people. The chorus of this song is um, what will become of the memories, basically once all the survivors pass away. Um, and so for me, that was the moment where I was like, okay, I want to get something to commemorate that. And um, on the wall of the Cohen Center, where we have all our classes, it says to remember and to teach. And so that was another, this experience that Marsh was living with another, like, drove home moment for me, like, why I uh, study this major. So the second time we went to Auschwitz was, as Tanner mentioned, with our other class, <coughs> with Dr. Gavron, and we spent 10 hours there, from about 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. We were in Auschwitz. Um, the first half of the day, we walked around Birkenau, like, pretty much every inch of Birkenau. Um, <coughs> this just shows you how vast it was, like I talked about before. I, this is like, that picture is in the middle of the row, and you can't even see the end of them, and there's two or three other ones to my left. So it's just massive. Um, and so as we walked around Birkenau, we went into different barracks, the um, wooden barracks, the brick barracks, and by all the destroyed crematoria, um, the Nazis destroyed all of them when they knew that the Soviets were coming. So they were trying to hide evidence of what they did. Um, and in the, at the end, there was the sauna, which is if you were chosen to work, you were sent through there. They took all your clothes, all your belongings, and they shaved your head and gave you a shower. Um, and so we were able to walk that path with exactly what those people walked. And at the end, they had a giant wall of photographs that were from people's belongings that they kept. And this one picture set out to me to tie me back to that song. You know, the one kid who was, you know, before the war. And so I just was drawn to that one. So I think it should have been. Couple more photos. Um, I was touched. Someone had left a rose on one of the barracks as we walked through, and I thought that was very powerful. Um, this is a photo of one of the wooden barracks in the uh, where I think this was the children's barrack actually. But I was just struck by how small it was. Um, like you read about how three people slept on one of those layers, including the bottom level. Um, so it was just kind of like powerful. Like okay, people. This is where people were um, face to face with that history. And so after we spent the first five hours of that day in Auschwitz, uh, uh, Birkenau, sorry, <clears throat> we spent the second half of the day having a guided tour by a guy who worked at the museum. Uh, each of the barracks in Auschwitz has been turned into a museum. Uh, various countries have been given one and they create their own commemoration uh, for the people that they lost during the Holocaust. Um, there's the famous Arbach Schmack Frei. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it means work sets you free, which is ironic because they worked them until they died. Um, and so that day was very, that uh, part of the museum was different in that everything was cha changed into various museums where Birkenau was left as it was, completely untouched. Um, <coughs> another thing that was a struggle for me under there was how pretty it was. I mean, the, the, that, that was the, a big quarrel. It's like, this land is beautiful. It's a beautiful forest. And just so that balance of like, what happened here versus, wow, it's a really beautiful day out, was uh, 
hard for me. Um, at the end of our time at Auschwitz, uh, one, we walked to, this is the only crematory that's left standing there. Uh, and we had, we were able to walk through it, um, which is one of the freakiest uh, experiences that I've had. I'm sure these guys can attest to it. Um, I mean, I can't, I don't think I can put into words what it was like to stand in there. You can see the claw, the claw marks on the wall from people scratching on the walls. You look up and it's just the hole in the ceiling where they poured the pellets in and like just thinking about how this is what someone saw. This is the last thing someone saw in their life was this room. And so that was just an overwhelming experience. Um, and right next to it is the oven, so you walk through and the oven's right there. Uh, so that was one of the heaviest, heaviest moments of our uh, time there. Um, for me, um, <coughs> having this experience, when we went to the DC Museum just this uh, in the last month, I was able to kind of contextualize everything better and have a deeper understanding of the images that they use there and the way that they've kind of laid out some of the pieces because I could say, okay, I know what this picture is of. I've walked right there. I've been in those places. And so that was like just, I felt like I understood more of the museum and more of what we've talked about in classes. Um, additionally, Holocaust films are just much more impactful for me because I can imagine the scenarios that they're attempting to portray and like know what it looks like. like the pianist takes place in Warsaw, and I know what Warsaw looks like. I walk through the ghetto. And I've been to Auschwitz, and so those things have more impact for me now after going here. <coughs> and so I will end with this Primo Levi quote. Uh, love him. He's an Italian uh, Jewish survivor of the Holocaust. He was in Auschwitz. Um, and he says, it happened, therefore it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. So he's basically saying that, look at what humanity can do to each other. And he's saying it's going to happen again, and he was right. It has happened multiple times since then. Um, and so this whole experience of studying abroad, being in these places, was just reinforced to me the importance of talking about the Holocaust and other genocides, because we are the carriers of these memories now. <coughs> and it's our responsibility as scholars in this major to make sure that never again can become a true statement someday. Um, specific moment but all of my favorite moments have been with these people here and even all of the difficult moments going through Auschwitz and studying these really terrible things we were there to rely on each other and help each other through it after we spent 10 hours in Auschwitz we came back and ordered pizza and just sat in our room and was like we don't want to go anywhere else <laughs> <laughs> and I think even now whenever we encounter difficult things even
even with Relate to this Field, but also in our own lives. We are always there for each other. So there isn't one memory, but the bond that we have, that's something that we definitely say. Yeah, I think on top of that, individually, we all grew a lot on this entire trip. Um, in more ways than just like academic, but I mean, we all um, went through like stuff that was either related to what we were doing in Poland or stuff that was related to what was going on back home. And I think just the whole, not even going to Poland, if we'd gone anywhere, if we'd been studying Spanish or communications, like just like, like <coughs> going abroad for a semester and being independent and like being by yourself. Um, because I mean, we were together, but like I said, like I had met Kayla once, like before this, and like it was just, it was, it just, I didn't know her, you know. It's like, so it was really difficult because we came as separate people and then came together during our trip there and grew individually and came back, you know, as like the best friend. So I think, um, I think it was just a lot of growing in general for all of us. Don't tear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's out of control. Yeah. I, lots of thoughts. Uh, one is to recognize uh, just how motivational your experience is, because you were the biggest group in this, and now you got yet another big group going, and you just motivated this room to to want to experience mm -hmm. uh, in a piece of, of what you did over five months. And I, I think telling the story. Um, whatever nugget is is, is going to pass it on to mm -hmm. and inspire others. Yeah, I, I, clearly you were inspired by your team by by what you've learned uh, prior to going. And and I, but I, I, I wonder, were there reflections about I, I wish I could have had this context before I went. Is there something more that you uh, reflect on now that that could have been imparted, and this is part of your 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 your, your opening question, right? Uh, what is it about international study that uh, is is so transformative? Is there something that that uh, in that process as you leave uh, or as you grow towards that kind of travel that that could be more informative? For you? More informative. Um, I think one of the things that we <coughs> kind of wish we had and sort of did for the students who went over this semester was sort of give them a crack at a 101 guide as far as mm -hmm. different things to do, places to see, different events to be participating in. Um, and I think not only that, but then also the connections that even Dr. Vincent helped establish while we were over there. Um, I think all of us would have certainly loved to intern at the Pollution Museum as one of the students interned now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having those connections would have been awesome beforehand, but, you know, we were able to, you're a recipient of him being there, certainly, and we were able to do more than what a student had been able to do previously. Um, so I think that was one of the benefits of going there, but also some of the benefits of the team right now. Yeah, we made a lot of really good connections. Um, and we also kind of <coughs> brought our futures into consideration, too, like, I know Tanner and Liam and me have all, like, honestly really considered going abroad to Europe to study graduate school now, just from seeing the system there and how, how other students appreciate it. Um, and <clears throat> so it's definitely put in perspective, uh, we have more options than, like, what's, like, just in the U.S. Um, you know, there's a whole world outside that we have to explore. Question. Mm -hmm. How do uh, Polish people teach their young people about the Soviet era? Do you know? Would you have an idea on that? Soviet specifically, um, I mean, they hate Russia. That's all I'm going to say. Like, <laughs> especially, especially now. They didn't like Russia to begin with. They definitely don't like Russia now. Um, they teach about, I mean, they teach about what their country did. So, I mean, you did a lot of like that on, like, solidarity movement. Yeah. Basically what's taught is it is very well taught, but it's taught in the way that <coughs> Poland overcame communism. Poland came together as a country, as Poland, and they reclaimed their history, they reclaimed their statehood, mm -hmm. and they re-became Poland. So that's kind of what's taught, is that's a triumph over. Like, they're taught about that it happened, and also because so many, it, Poland's only been a democracy for about 20 years, so it's a very recent history, so it's very well known, not only in schools, but also it's passed down from parents to kids. So it's a very well taught. A lot of uh, people are still very influenced yeah. by it. Um, people have are in the 
the Soviet mindset. You have the older people who are like, man, back in the good old days of communism, like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> um, and then you have, um, I mean, it's, it's a very progress. I mean, the, the young people in the, in the country are very progressive. Um, so it's an interesting contrast. Do <coughs> you have a question? I do. It's just for the three of you guys. Um, when I picked up Tanner in Boston, yeah. you guys came home, I asked, I asked him, I said, uh, you know, we're headed back to Connecticut and we're going to have dinner and we have a lot of time to talk. I said, well, what's the one thing that you did where you grew the most? And, and, and he looked at me and, and I said, not about the education, what's the one thing that you, where did you grow up the most? And he, he snapped his head around like a hoot owl. And you're not going to take a passport and go anywhere. I'm not afraid to go anywhere right now. I can go anywhere. How about you guys? I never heard that story. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's so cool. Um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, honestly, I mean, yeah, I, I can't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably repeating myself, but it kind of, for me, it goes back to like what I was saying. Like, I, 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 I feel the same way. I feel like I've grown so much. I feel so much more independent. Like. Going back to Poland again and going back to Europe again would be way more comfortable. I feel like way more comfortable with, with what I was doing, and um, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intense experience, like going abroad for the first time. It was pretty terrifying, like arriving in Poland, getting off a plane, and just like it's overwhelming at some points. But I feel like I could, I could do it now, and I would have a much better handle on the situation and on myself, and be able to get more out of going abroad a second time. Um, so I think that was, you know. There wasn't really one moment for me. It was just kind of like, I don't know. It's just, a growth. It was a growth. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah. Um, I definitely feel the same thing if I could go anywhere. I kind of feel like after Poland, I lost some of the fears that I had of, because at first going to Poland, I was like, I don't speak Polish. How's this going to go? Um, <laughs> and then after that, I realized that I could really go anywhere and I could figure it out. <laughs> Um, I'm actually I'm going to Bosnia next year for an internship, and everyone's been asking me like, you can't speak Bosnian. I'm like, oh, I'll work it out. <laughs> um, so I've kind of lost kind of that fear and that worry of like, what if, what, if, what, what what's the worst thing that could happen? I kind of found some self confidence that I could figure it out. I agree. Um, at the beginning, it was like I feel like we were all very hesitant to like travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we knew a way around Krakow, but then like going somewhere else, we're like, oh my god, we just figured out Krakow, like. How are we going to figure it out? But we just took a map and we, we just went with it. And towards the end of the trip, I spent a week in Germany. I traveled completely by myself. Um, yeah. And so I just, like, I don't, I'm not even scared to do anything by myself anymore. Like, the way home, I was like, thank God Kat and Olivia aren't flying with me. I just like to be by myself. Like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on the way there, we were so nervous. Yeah, I took it on the way back. It was like, all right. Yeah, that was all right. So, the flight there was. Yeah. I don't know. I still feel better being in. For those of you guys who don't know, it wasn't just the four of us. Um, Olivia, who is another student here, was with us. Um, she had other obligations, so she couldn't do this, but um, that's her in the bottom right here. So it was, it was mostly the five of us who were going around, but the four of us are presenting here. I really hope I got all that. 